All right, happy Friday, everybody. Hopefully, everybody's doing good. Today, this is going to be our 11:30 IG takeover. Uh, we're Queen Strength and Conditioning, being myself, Colin McCaws, and the Head Strength and Conditioning Coach. We're going to talk about a couple different concepts uh, that I think could be useful to everybody. So, this is a topic that I've kind of put on the back burner a little bit because I wanted to kind of dive into it a little bit more. And this is something that I see um, during quarantine, and this is something that I've seen even in years past when when our athletes go home for the summer or we start working with incoming recruits and, and so on and so forth, when people kind of have autonomy over their own training, which is great and people should do what's fun for them. Uh, but one thing we notice is that people tend to gravitate towards training that they've always done or just like things that just feel good, which there's benefits to that by all means. But uh, I just kind of want to provide some information kind of behind the scenes on, on what the difference is between training for a sport and working out and this to me is the number one most overlooked thing by young athletes is they think that as long as we sweat and as long as we do something and as long as we exercise we're going to get better at our subsequent subsequent sport which isn't necessarily true um so i'm going to walk you through a couple things that i've noticed over the last few weeks and then by all means feel free to comment in the uh in, in the comments below or send a, a dm and whatnot but the goal of this isn't to shun anybody or anything along those lines it's just simply we notice trends uh, of just training or working out for the sake of working out when we want to really make sure we're meeting the demands of the sports in which we want to play. So one thing that we saw quite a bit of uh, in, recent, uh, in recent scenarios, especially down south, is we noticed that uh, people using the sport of CrossFit to train for sport or even to test for sport. Uh, I'm not, I thoroughly think uh, that that type of high intensity functional training can be beneficial, especially as a sport itself, but it doesn't transfer over to soccer, football, basketball, and so on and so forth. It has general components to it, which can improve some general fitness, but I can't say that if you get better at a CrossFit style workout that you're necessarily going to get better at your sport. So this is something that we've seen posted online. This was kind of a hot topic recently where, where a school in the States brought their athletes back to campus after COVID and they put them through the Murph challenge, which takes a significant period of time, which is a ton of volume, a ton of repetitions. And it's just there to be a challenging workout, obviously in memory of, of a soldier down there. But this is not a good workout that we should be doing for sport performance. There's no reason why athletes should be doing hundred pull-ups, 200 push-ups, and 300 squats in one workout to prep them for the demands of a high intensity sport like rugby or football or basketball or volleyball. Nothing in this workout will correspond to improved performance in that. And, and on the other side of the spectrum, it actually likely will put you at a higher risk of injury because of your form is going to break down inevitably. You're, you're not going to be able to provide proper mechanics throughout these ranges of motions. You're going to develop poor habits in this, and it doesn't necessarily meet the demands of what we're doing. Now, taking this one step further, and I think most logical strength and conditioning coaches and coaches wouldn't have their team sport athletes do this in training camp or throughout their, uh, throughout their off-season programming. But one thing we do see is common conditioning tests or protocols that are used. So things like the 300-yard shuttle, this is something that's been around for a long time. It's basically two lines are 25 yards apart. We go there and back six times. You record that. You take a five-minute break, and then you repeat it. That's the actual test, and you actually measure the two durations in which you did and the, the decrement and the fall-off that you had, and that kind of determines your fatigue index. For sports that have a huge an uh, anabolic, or sorry, uh, anaerobic component to it, uh, by all means, this, this might be a test that, that you can challenge yourself with. But using this as a conditioning stimulus for a sport like football where we spend majority of our time in a play that's five or six seconds or less, and we get an average of 25 seconds to 35 seconds of recovery time between plays, we don't have a need to necessarily develop our efficiency in a 300-yard shuttle. It's tough for the sake of being tough, but it doesn't really provide us with much sport specificity or even like outcomes in which we're looking for. It, it actually looks nothing like the sport in which we're playing. So I don't really know where these have come from. They've been around forever. Uh, they're tough for the sake of being tough, but they don't necessarily provide us with with much desirable outcome. The other thing here is like traditional cone drills. You'll see things like agility ladders and you'll see things like all these variations of different cone drills. These serve a purpose. But if these make up 90% of your agility training and your change of direction work, you're missing the point. It doesn't, agility has a massive component to it and arguably the largest component to it is your ability to read other people's body language and you to be able to make informed decisions about where you need to move your body into space. So an offensive player's job in every single sport is to try to create space. A defensive player's job is to try to reduce space. That truly is what agility is. Using your speed, your ability to deceleration, and then in, obviously to accelerate in the direction you want to go based on what your opponent is doing. So if this makes up the majority of your training and you're not doing things like mirror drills, box drills, uh, you're not doing things like cat and mouse drills, you're missing a massive part of the equation here. Um, so I think when we see a lot of this stuff online, like these fancy footworks and these pitter-patter footworks, they don't really provide us with the outcomes in which we're looking for. Once again, they've been around forever and they're hard, but they don't actually help prepare us for sport. So there's a principle here known as the said principle. And I think this is important for people to understand is specific adaptations to impose demands. And all this really means is like, 
if I want to get, if I want to jump higher in, in, in uh, volleyball, well, I should be working on jumping or I should be working on things in that plane of motion, like a squat, for example, to create force and jumping to create velocity to therefore improve my power output. So that's critically important for us where we're just not doing things for the sake of doing them. There's no reason why a volleyball player should be running 10K to improve their volleyball performance. If you like doing it and it's early in your off season, go for it. But it's not really going to provide you any benefit down the road and arguably it might even take away from it. So it's really important to think about like what are the demands of the sport. So when we take two different sports here like cross country and rugby, two very different tasks on the complete opposite ends of the spectrum, uh, different demands are placed on the body. Uh, and, and training has to reflect the demands of that sport. So if I take a rugby athlete and I train them like a cross-country athlete, or I train, take a cross-country athlete and train them like a rugby athlete, we're going to be missing the point here. We're not going to have the body compositions necessary for that sport. We're not going to be able to produce the forces required in those certain fields uh, or those certain sports and demands. We're, we're, we're just creating generalists. We're now sport. As our athletes grow up and we go from year one in university at 17, 18 years old to 21 or 22, we need to provide a continuum there that our athletes can get a little bit more specific. So... Yes, everybody still needs to squat. Yes, everybody still needs to hinge. Everybody needs to learn how to do an appropriate plank. Everybody should work on sprint technique. But different volumes and intensities at different time of the year is really what's going to make uh, key performance improve here, which is really important for us. I'm going to use soccer as an example here because this is a presentation we did not too long ago with one of our soccer teams where if you look at, this is a breakdown from a textbook of the physiological basis of exercise in sport back in 1998 that what they did is they took the three different energy systems and broke them down and i don't really need to dive into this too much for you but basically this system here the atp pc system this is all power development six seconds or less i'm producing massive amounts of energy oxidative system is this low intensity work walking or light jogging using my oxygen to recover my atp pc system uh, but this is really low intensity low heart rate work well if you look at a lot of our sports that we work with, we're at 80% of this power development. We're very minimal percentage here of oxidative and definitely minimal in the glycolytic. If you look at football, which isn't on here, it's actually quite similar where it's about 80% uh, uh, ATP PC, very fast, six seconds or less, with a very low oxidative output and very little glycolytic. We call that like an alactic aerobic sport. Uh, and you'll see the same thing, hockey. Even though the average hockey shift might be 40 seconds long, if you break the shift down, or 20 to 40 seconds long, if you break that shift down, you'll notice it's really truly the repeatability of power which makes a big difference. So what is the goal of training versus working out? Our goal is to work backwards from the sport itself, develop what we think is important for it. Is that a 10-yard sprint and has high correlation? Is it a broad jump, a vertical jump? Is it upper body relative strength, lower body relative strength, single leg strength, whatever it might be? Or is it 10 kilometer time? My point of this is that when we really break down training versus working out, I can go for five kilometer runs. I can just do core circuits. I can do body weight circuits and so on and so forth. And I can get a good workout and I can burn calories, but those aren't working backwards from the sport. Those don't provide a ton of insight and a ton of specificity that's going to carry over to training for my specific sport itself. So I'll use soccer as another example. In soccer, we do a sprint for about two to four seconds every 90 seconds. And there's tons of research on each sport. This is really complicated. I know these numbers look a lot, but really all I want you to focus on is here, this high speed running. Uh, and this is in total meters. In one game, based on the position, if you look here, we're looking at about 700 meters of sprint work at high velocities and high outputs. We're looking at 10 kilometers in total distance over the game. For most of our athletes, if I tell you to run 90, uh, if I tell you to run 10 kilometers in 90 minutes, that is not hard to do. That is not a far amount of distance. It, it, you're likely going to complete that in well less than 90 minutes. It's not that impressive to be able to cover those distances. What is impressive of you is your ability to repeat power here. You have to have a strong lower body. You have to have proper body composition. You have to be able to do that. Just running for duration and duration and duration doesn't really help because soccer actually, a lot of the time is made up from slight light jogging and even walking. If you look at top end players like Leo Messi, he actually walks more than other players do. So I think that's really important to look at the accelerations, decelerations and high speed outputs. When I look at football, this is we're looking at an average play of about 5.2 seconds, and obviously 20-second uh, play clock in the CFL, but 30 second, 36 is on average the total duration with timeouts and everything like that in TV and in American football. But we're looking at an average of six plays per drive, and we're looking at significant positional differences to consider between linemen and so on and so forth. So there's no reason why our linemen should be running crazy long distances that our receivers are running. There's no reason why we should be doing... If we were doing 300 yard shuttles when we're looking at an average play duration of 5.2 seconds, it's going to take you at least 60 seconds to do a 300 yard shuttle. It doesn't prepare you for the demand of the sport. It's tough, but so is doing 100 burpees. So it doesn't look anything like the sport itself. So what are we noticing in Canadian football versus American football? Obviously, dis different distances in sprinting uh, due to having a run up for our receivers. Greater eccentric strength. We have to change direction. So we might need to work on our agility a little bit more or our ability to, to decelerate. And we need an ability to create this uh, repeated sprint condition a little bit more because due to smaller roster sizes, our athletes might have to play multiple sides of the ball. But once again, a lot of numbers here. But when we look at different positions, 
the total distance covered in a game is not that much. Like we're not even covering five kilometers in a game for any of our athletes. And that's a lot of it is walking. If I look at here at my wide receivers at 4,400 meters in a game, 3,500 meters of that is at a low distance speed of simply like walking and jogging on and off the field. That is not taxing. We don't need to spend the majority of our time training that. We do what we need to spend is this differential here of about 295 meters. We need to work on top end speed. We need to work on our acceleration ability. And if you even look at the offensive linemen, obviously their high end speed is not super high because they're not actually accelerating more than a few yards. But the majority of their game is spent at 3,000 meters of a total 3,200 at like very low intensity speeds. So we need to know that we need to maximize those first few steps and we need to allow them to create large levels of isometric and concentric strength and power uh, so that our athletes can be able to, to resist forces or create uh, movement for the other athletes that they're going up against. So once again, if we work backwards from the sport, we know that we don't need to just work out. We need to kind of dive in a little bit deeper. Let's look at hockey. Average shift length is 30 to 90 seconds. Average shift of high intensity work is 18 seconds in that shift. Approximately 14 to 25 shifts per game, 1.5 to 5 minutes recovery on the bench. Work to rest ratio is 1 to 3. For every bout of high intensity work, you're taking about 3 to 6 seconds off the ice. Uh, and then within the shift, for every second you output really high intensity work, you're getting about a second and a half back. Different stoppages per shift, time to, between stoppages is 42 seconds and so on. My point here is, if you break this down even further, it's the short, quick starts and stops in hockey that make the biggest difference. So once again, your ability to repeat and accelerate is critically important. No coach that I've ever worked with has been like, oh, our athletes are too fast. They're always like, get them to be quicker and more explosive in their ability to repeat that into the third period or even overtime. Basketball, once again, speed of movement here, walking. Uh, Lots of distance covered in walking, lots of distance covered in jogging, but this is really the difference maker here. Although you're only spending 4.5% of your time, winning those critical balls and winning those critical uh, sprints to a ball is going to be everything for our athletes. Uh, sorry, I guess sprinting was down here, but 2.8%. Critically, critically important because we need a larger aerobic base here because we're in a tighter quarters and there's obviously going to be a lot more changes of direction. But if we can build that aerobic base through appropriate time constraints, we don't need to run these crazy long distances and so on. So this is just breaking down speeds that athletes hit. And obviously, if you look at 100 meter dash and elite level 100 meter dash players, they'll hit 23.4 miles per hour. But it's not uncommon for a football player to hit over 20 miles per hour. We've had a few of those in our career. Same thing for rugby's on the wings. Uh, obviously, same thing in soccer. It's not that uncommon. But if we spend all of our time down here just jogging at three miles per hour or five miles per hour, six miles per hour, it doesn't really benefit when we want to get up here. We're not driving the car that we have. So one more thing is this is looking at relative proportion of total motor units. What's the point of having a car with five or six gears when we would spend all of our time down here and really not doing any uh, high threshold work? We're not doing, you need to be doing, sorry, maximal sprints, medicine ball throws, which we made a video about yesterday, jumping. These types of things are going to allow you to produce the most power and the most speed, which we just talked about being critically important for our athletes. Doing body weight circuits, core work, and all this stuff down here doesn't really provide the most bang for our buck. We're not really getting this. Sets of 10 or 15 don't really provide us with this. We need to try to drive this threshold up and we need to spend a little bit more time working on sprinting, jumping, change of direction, agility work. We need to work on the things that actually create the most bang for our buck. And to finish up, general to specific is critically important for us. So we start, and I'm not saying that CrossFit workouts can't be good or running can't be good and so on and so forth, but those things would be done very early in our off season if we were to do them at all. But we want to take those opportunities to start build the tissue quality, build the movement patterns, and start stacking things up on one another that build us closer to our game time competition. So uh, a lot of our athletes historically have played club in the summer, so we have to think about, we only have three months, four months for some of our athletes before they start getting back into competition. So we need to find a quick way to work on the movement patterns, get them feeling healthy, build up a little bit of resilience through, through what we call our general prep. So that's GPP, general preparatory, preparatory period. Just get them moving and get them comfortable. And then we're going to build up into our specific preppers. Now we're looking at specific sprint distances this appropriate. Now we're looking at the jump volumes that are appropriate. Now we're trying to build strength or power or, or hypertrophy, whatever we're doing for that sport. It's critically important that we fill those buckets appropriately for that sport. And we just don't do things for the sake of doing things. So uh, to wrap things up, uh, hopefully this didn't come across as, as, as negative in any way, but these are just trends that I see. I see a lot of... Uh, a lot of just exercising when we really need to be dialing things in a little bit more specifically to try to think about, well, now I have a huge opportunity in quarantine to work on my sprint technique. I have a huge opportunity to work on my technical development and my ability to juggle a ball or to run a route or whatever it might be. I have a huge opportunity to work on my ability to decelerate, change direction and use my siblings to create some agility. Um, those are things that will help us carry over and transition back into sport. If all we've done during quarantine is go for runs, do some core workouts and just do just a ton of repetitions on body weight work, you might feel pretty good, but when you get back onto the field, you're going to find that you're going to fall behind. We're not going to be taking those steps forward, and we're not going to be maximizing our opportunities here to get better. So 
that's my little rant for the day. Hopefully everybody's doing great. If you have questions, by all means, put them in the comment box or DM us. Uh, we can go into things a little bit further. And just, just another thing too is today at one o'clock, we're gonna do our athlete spotlight. And then in addition to this, going forward for the rest of the month of June, as well as July and August, we're actually gonna pull back a little bit on our 11.30 a.m.s. So feel free to, uh, to reach out if you have questions, but you're not gonna see us post every single day anymore. But we appreciate everybody's support. We will still be posting. And if you have questions, by all means, feel free to reach out. Have a great weekend, everybody, and we'll talk to you soon.